going on, everybody? Good evening, good evening. Welcome to uh, another Dearborn Open Mic here at the National Arab American National Museum. Just get this out of the way real quick. How's everybody doing tonight? Good. It's very good to see you guys. Uh, some of the advice I get sometimes is um, I'm told to be myself, be yourself. It's a common thing they say. You know, I'm, I'm having trouble, it's hard, things are difficult. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm having trouble fitting in, people don't accept me, so on and so on. Trying to get along with my family. And the advice is always be yourself. Uh, but sometimes when I be myself, um, I'm given another set of advice, which is something along the lines of stop that. <laughs> so, starts with be yourself. And then stop that. And I, and I have yet to figure out exactly where the line is between be yourself and stop that. And the advice comes subtle. It's not like, hey, stop that. It's um, usually a gesture of some kind. Somebody may say, you know, maybe I start talking a certain way or dressing a certain way and I get a little too comfortable. And the advice generally is something like maybe a nudge or a look or something like that. Rarely is it verbalized. When it's verbalized, the word I get is aib. They say, I, and they're nice about it, I understand, you know. I just don't, I still don't know what that means. I haven't yet figured out exactly what one means by I. What it means socially is I've crossed the social line, but I can't figure out what it is. So I ask, but I'm not sure. So when I was growing up, for example, um, we would go over to Azim. Let's say, usually, it was usually on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, we go over to Azim, we go to folks' house, and when we walked in, um, I would sit down, and let's say if I took a seat, there was, um, let me see if I can remember one of the rules. One of the rules was, you, you have to stand until somebody sits down. So like, let's say somebody enters the room. We have to stand up, and then we stand, and then as far, from my perspective, for an indefinite period of time, until everybody sits. So everybody goes, and then I sit. But I always miss the cue. I don't know what, what the clue is that, that caused everyone else to sit down. It's like tacit, it's tacit, it's like secret. It's not really secret, I'm supposed to know what it is. And if I don't know what it is, I'm gestured to, like you're supposed to like sit down, you know? There was another one I remember also when I was sitting down. Um, sometimes I would raise my foot and immediately a gesture would come along to like not do that. So, it, And I, uh, I still don't know Precisely. I, so I was told, I was told that uh, in the Arabic culture or in, in some Eastern cultures, exposing the bottom of one's foot is aib. Um, but I still don't know why. I still don't know. I know it's aib. I know it's rude. But I don't understand why in some cultures it is and in some cultures it's not. So being yourself is difficult because I'm always on alert for uh, what it means to be oneself, at the same time, what it means to violate that rule somehow. So I'm still learning. So if anybody has any advice or any suggestions on that, I'd appreciate it. It's something I'm exploring, it's something I wanna learn, um, and it's something I really wanna get better at because I'm realizing that, you know, especially this day and age, uh, as we go on to speak our minds and speak one's mind, it's also important to keep these social rules in mind. Something funny is happening though in the 21st century. It's becoming harder and harder to communicate those rules because to get, we're not really having much of a communion together. A lot of the stuff that's going on is maybe in a, in a group chat or in a, a private meeting online or on social media. And there's less and less of gatherings like this where actual people actually get together in an actual space. And the Dearborn Open Mic uh, strives to facilitate that, to give us a space and opportunity to get together and be here. So please make some noise. We welcome you. Thank you guys for coming. I really appreciate you having here. We're here every third Wednesday of the month at the Dearborn Open Mic English program. There's an Arabic program that is every first Wednesday of the month. English program is here, third Wednesday of the month. And I'm your host, uh, Yusuf Al Qamusi, or as uh, my stage name is Wordman. I come to the stage to be myself. You know, I, right now I'm not acting. I don't act on stage. I, I'm on stage to be myself. In public, I'm acting. When I'm in, in traffic, I'm acting. When I'm in line at the grocery store, I'm acting. Or again, when I'm a guest at someone's house, there's a certain de decorum or a demeanor that I have to put up. But here I get to be myself. Today I'd like to invite a member of our community, 
uh, to also join me in being himself. I, um, there's something that uh, happens to me every once in a while. This is a true story. I'll be like sitting at home eating cereal, I don't know, Frosted Flakes. If you know the story about the Frosted Flakes, you know. I'm at home downing Frosted Flakes most of the time uh, by myself. And sometimes I'll, um, I'll just be interrupted by a thought. Something hits me. Abdullah's the mayor. <laughs> Abdullah's the mayor. It just hit suddenly, you know what I mean? I'll be driving, I'll be in traffic, and I'll just be going through, and I'm somewhere on Michigan Avenue trying to figure out how, what, what the maze of the day is in the city, trying to get from point A to point B. And I'll pass by City Hall, and I'll go, Abdullah's in there. You know, we know him as Mayor Hamoud, we know him as uh, former state rep, Abdullah Hamoud, but uh, I remember him as Abdullah, and I'm very grateful to Abdullah because he always corrects me. I remember one time he came to speak in my classroom, I was a teacher at Fortson High School, and he came uh, uh, to speak to our students, and I invited him up, and as he walked in, I said, you know, uh, it's nice to see you, Abdullah. At that time, I believe you were either running or had gotten the position as, uh, as a state rep. So I walked up and said, you know, uh, Rep Abdullah Hamoud, he said, call me Abdullah. Same thing happened uh, another time as he was the mayor, Mr. Mayor, call me Abdullah. So I call him Abdullah, and I know him as Abdullah. I'd like to introduce you to Abdullah if you don't know him. Uh, he's someone I've known for many years and someone I really enjoy uh, talking to and getting to know. So what I'd like to do is just have a little bit of time with uh, the mayor of the city, uh, Abdullah Hamoud. Abdullah, can you join me on stage, please? Would you prefer this side or this side? Do you have a preference? Where are you comfortable? Right here? Wonderful. Let's talk to Abdullah. Salam, everyone. Do you struggle to be yourself? Do I struggle to be myself? I think, similar to you, uh, the mayor, there's a lot more rules of aibness that you have to understand. And people love Abdullah Hassan Hamoud and the idea of it becoming mayor until you no longer do. Um, and so uh, I don't struggle to be myself. I enjoy being myself. But what I realize is people will enjoy you as yourself until it's no longer beneficial to their ultimate goal or whatever it might be. And so I'm the, I, I love being myself. Sometimes I think my wife might not enjoy what I do uh, for a living. You know, if you're trying to eat at Malik al-Kabab or something and it becomes a coffee hour because everybody's walking up to talk about garbage and taxes and, and I'm just trying to eat my hummus and mtabbal. And, but uh, I think there's a few times that you're just like, man, I really wish I wasn't the mayor right now. My wife is like, I can't believe I married a politician. And so, but alhamdulillah, most of the time I'm, I'm proud of uh, and happy with who I am. Um, I, uh, I, I can't possibly relate to the degree that you must face, but I know as a teacher uh, in, in, in the school system, uh, I also feel sometimes that there's a role I have to play both in the classroom and outside of it. You know, and sometimes I get stuck as well on, um, on, on that. Does it... I guess talk to us about what it, what it means to you to be Abdullah and what it means to you to be a resident in Dearborn outside of mayor or otherwise. I, I think, uh, for those who don't know, uh, if I haven't introduced myself, forgive me, Abdullah Hassan Hamoud. Um, and for, if you really want to know me, it's, it's, it's understanding my family. I'm the son of Haji Hassan Hamoud, the son of Haji Ghada. I am the second oldest of five siblings. I'm the wife of Fatima Beydoun. I'm the Abu Maryam. I'm the father of Maryam, who is uh, 20 months strong now. Um, also in this community, I'm known as the nephew of Sheikh Ahmed Hamoud and Hash Hassan, who takes the hamle to the Hajj. And so uh, people know the family in which I grew up in. Um, that's Abdullah at, at its most basic core. Uh, somebody who grew up with as traditional of a Muslim Arab lifestyle as you can imagine within one's household. Um, the strongest identity marker for me is my faith. I'm Muslim before I'm anything. And I think to me that's what holds me true. And I have a firm belief that uh, regardless of what happens in life, and that's what grounds me ultimately on what happens. I think most people, you know, yes, I'm a Dearborn resident. I look at it as I'm Abdullah from Dearborn who happened to graduate from Fortson, the greatest school uh, in the world. And thank you. And uh, if you're from Dearborn High, the exit is that way. Um, and I just happen to have a little extra responsibility. And that responsibility for me, from my perspective, is now a wajib. Things that I must do to help accommodate and improve the quality of life for Dearborn residents across the city, regardless of where you come from, your background, the direction in which you pray. That's my role. 
Um, and what I would tell you as mayor and that I've learned, even as state rep, I've been doing public service now for seven years. People have a tough time differentiating between Abdullah the elected and Abdullah the Muslim. Uh, and I think that's what typically opens up the, the door for criticism. Are you saying there's like a, there's a struggle between personal identity and professional identity? Absolutely. Like I imagine that? similar to you. You know, sure. you're a teacher, and I imagine people think that teacher has to have a certain decorum and etiquette that Yusuf might not be able to have. And if they criticize you, they're not criticizing you for the quality of teacher that you are. They're criticizing you for the fluidity and who Yusuf is when he's outside the classroom. Uh, and I think that, that, that's where people don't understand. Um, do, you ever, do you feel there's a reward as well for being in this position? For example, you mentioned a responsibility, and that is a professional responsibility. Is there a personal responsibility as well in the, in the position you're in? Absolutely. Uh, there, there's, you know, regardless of what you do for a living, you know, it, it's easier, it's more easily delineated if you're a physician, for example. If you're a cardiac surgeon, your responsibility is to try to achieve 100% success rate with every cardiac surgery that you have. With Mayor, the metrics are a little bit different. People would define it differently. Um, but you have a responsibility to achieve a set of goals that you set out, that you've campaigned on. The difference, though, is you know, when you go see like a physician or a teacher, nobody voted on that surgeon or teacher. There's a certain path. You conclude school. You get your certification. You conduct a fellowship, and you're qualified. Um, maybe Yelp reviews exist about how this surgeon is. The reality is when I come into office, I came in with 55% of the vote. So 45% already didn't want me there. And now, it's, now you're teetering. And, you know, so this idea that you're trying to make people happy or you have to accommodate to all, you have to throw that out the window. And so the responsibility is there and you have to accept that you will never make 100% of people happy with what you do. If you cannot accept that, this isn't the line of business for you. Um, I guess I'll ask you one more question and then actually we're going to take a more, uh, more formal interview to talk about you as the mayor, but I'm really curious about you as, as, as the person. Um, and I've known you as the person, you know, and, and, and those of us who have known you all, all have. Um, I guess I want to leave kind of with, with one quick question. What does, we know, we know Mayor Hamoud, state rep, but I want to ask you, what does Abdullah want his community to know? Whether it's in this position or personally or otherwise, um, what does Abdullah want to say to us? That's an interesting question. Um, a few things. One is that my f if I can never be there for my family in the capacity that I need to be, that I'd be failing the whole community. Um, so my family, my immediate family is first and foremost, always. It's a non-negotiable for anything that I do. Um, second, as it pertains to me just waking up each and every single day, you know, I, I got asked this question one time. You know, it was two questions. One was, do you think you deserve to be mayor? And the second was, uh, do you want people to know of your successes as mayor? Uh, my answer to the first is, uh, I don't know if I deserve it. And frankly, it doesn't matter. I'm here. Um, <laughs> I appreciate that. I'm, um, and and uh, I think, you know, I try to keep myself humble because humility is extremely important. I just try to do the best that I can with the time that I have. And you will decide what happens in a re-election or you know, what, what comes in the future. So I leave that determination to all of you. It's not for me to self-evaluate myself. On the question of, you know, do I want people to know my successes, you know, my response is, I just want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to know what I've done, whether it's public or not. That, to me, is the ultimate of rewards. I firmly believe that. Again, my faith is the closest thing to me. It's what keeps me grounded. Um, in the most difficult of times, and especially at the times when you feel you're on top of the world. Uh, you know, after, when I first won state rep, um, there's no, you know, there's, there's an amazing feeling when you win an election. I'm not going to lie about it. It's like a, you know, you have an adrenaline rush. Um, but the very next day, I was at the masjid uh, in Sujud, just praying, knowing that um, I did what I needed to do, and the rest was in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and, and that's all I can ask for. Um, I never pray for something specific. I've never prayed to be mayor. I've never prayed to be state rep. I've always prayed if there's something that has khair for it to come closer. And if there is no khair in this uh, endeavor, I hope it stays away from me. We love you, Abdullah. <laughs> Thank you for everything, Abdullah.
I guess here's what we want to do with the remainder of our time. Um, since we have you here as a special guest, we kind of want to uh, maximize that time with you and hear from you. First, we want to talk to you as the mayor and you know uh, ask some questions regarding those issues. So we'll have an interviewer do that. Um, after that, we can take some questions and answers. If there's anyone who would like to ask uh, Mayor Hamoud any questions, um, if, you, if you're okay with that, we'll do a little bit of that. And if there's a little bit of time at the end, you know, this is an open mic, and we invite people to come up and, and uh, kind of share a piece of who they are. Would you be able to share with us uh, something toward the end of the show, something you've written or uh, personal? Is that something you could do for us? I'm, ha I'm happy to go off the cuff. I, I have a... Um, I used to do spoken poetry years ago. It's been 15 years. Um, it's been some time, but uh, I don't remember any of that. But I'm happy to just give my random thoughts, if you like. We'd love that. Yeah, anything you can do. Of course. Okay, perfect. So um, I guess we'll begin with, with an interview real quick. I'll introduce uh, Wissam Sharafuddin to take it from here. All right. Make some noise for Wissam, please. Thank you. Dear Mayor, welcome Abdallah. to <laughs> welcome to Dearborn Open Mic, and thanks everyone who made it here uh, tonight. Given that we don't get many Sundays in Michigan, so don't be scared from the paper. It's just I don't want to forget some of the comments, and we're squeezed uh, with time. So first of all, I want to deliver the greetings of Ambassador Dr. Ali Ajami. Uh, to you, the president of the Arab American Center for Culture and Arts, who was not able to be with us today because he's in overseas. And he wants to thank you on behalf of the executive board of the center and on behalf of all of us for giving us your valuable time. So uh, Dome was born out of Dearborn Blog. Dearborn Blog was founded in 2013. Uh, it was a reaction to the spotlight shed on Dearborn that was predominantly negative at that time and remarkably inaccurate. And when people came to defend it, most of what they offered is our traditional food that we show generosity through and our folklore and dance. We wanted to show that there is much more to Dearborn than that, so we created a platform where uh, Dearborners can express themselves, can uh, provide their thoughts and feelings and intellect. Ten years since that time, the narrative is changing and there is nothing more powerful in the change of that narrative than you becoming the mayor of Dearborn. So I have a few questions and then we'll open up the questions to the audience. So although many are still getting Dearborn wrong, Sometimes even people so close, closely tied to the administration who, for example, in 2020 thought of describing social distancing in a sign posted in West Dearborn as 24 shawarmas apart, which they uh, came to discover that it wasn't funny and uh, kind of, of course, intentionally, it was unintentional, but it was a reduction of our culture uh, to shawarma. But, only an Arab American would probably get that uh, firsthand or get that, you know, get that uh, point without uh, much thought to it. Well, now we have an Arab American mayor. So how do you envision the entwining of the Arab American culture and legacy into Dearborn's heritage? You have, you have two things that you're, you're mixing together. Uh, they have been coexisting and they have been uh, uh, living in, in one space together. And now, in your persona, it is, it is the most symbolic thing of the intermixing and integrating of these two legacies, the Arab American legacy and the Dearborn great legacy. And sometimes it's challenging to mix these two histories. So how do you, how do you, see, how do you handle this challenge? On the note of the, the shawarma, I want to start there. When I came into office, I met with that team. And they gave me their new marketing deck to market our downtown West Dearborn and downtown East Dearborn. And they're giving me the presentation. I'm sitting quietly and I'm going to picture after picture. The first picture was at Wagner Park, uh, a group of uh, uh, white and, and, and black individuals sitting in the park. Beautiful picture. The second picture was a picture of a white couple with a white child riding a bike. Uh, the third picture was a picture of an interracial couple holding hands walking through downtown Dearborn. And the fourth picture was a woman in hijab holding a box of batlewa. And I closed the deck and I let her finish her presentation. And I said, 
Why didn't you just take a picture of who hangs out at Wagner Park on any random day? Like, why did you hire these people to stand there to take pictures who are not even from Dearborn? Um, and she said, well, we just wanted to make sure it was stage, controlled environment, so on and so forth. And I told her, I said, you know, if you were working in the black community, would you put a picture of a black individual eating something stereotypical that's typically characterized of, of the black community like you did a woman in hijab holding a box of batlewa? And she just got quiet, not understanding what was wrong with the pitch deck. Three months later, the whole firm was fired. Um, and so we brought, we insourced it. And sometimes I think the problem is you rely on folks outside the community to do the job for something that's needed from somebody who's within the community, understanding the perspective and diversity. You talk about two greatnesses, which is Dearborn and Arab community. It should be looked at as one. Dearborn story has a Arab American story. I think the best thing that we can do is to not distinguish between the two, but to tell the story that the Arab American community has allowed the Dearborn as a city to flourish. And so what we don't do is we don't shy away from who we are. If you look at our administration, we have the most diverse administration in the city's history. Uh, we went from only one Arab American appointee, technically, ever in the city's history, to now 60% of my appointees are minority. I have a Syrian, an Egyptian, a Yemeni, a Lebanese, with a, 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 bra, a, a wide uh, breadth of the Arab diaspora represented within the city. And I think that is how you begin to tackle this when it's no longer new, when it becomes standardized, when we elevate Arab art and Arab culture without having to apologize that, oh, I'm not trying to accommodate. I'm, it's a part of the Dearborn community. It's me saying my name Abdullah and not Abdullah. Uh, it's all these things that I think add with time. The normalization that the Arab community is here is something we're proud of. It's something we elevate and we don't shy away from. And those who stigmatize, they are in the wrong because the most radical thing is actually ignorance. Um, and that's what's present. Thank you. So one of the aspirations that we had at the Arab American Center for Culture and Arts is the question, can Dearborn become a capital of Arab American culture and arts? It's definitely uh, entitled to, it's definitely has uh, a lot of the, uh, what nominates it to, to become one. Uh, how do you envision when you hear that name? What would, what would make Dearborn genuinely a capital of culture and arts? How can we attract Arabic art, Arab American art, Arab American culture from all over the country to congregate and have incentives to move to Dearborn? First and foremost, I mean, we're sitting inside the Arab American National Museum. I'd be remiss if we didn't mention yep. this beautiful institution that we have that no other city or state has in the whole exactly, country. Exactly, the only one. We have to elevate that. Secondly, you have to display the art in public places. This institution is beautiful, but it's not enough to have art in a closed building. You know, I just came from the pop artist mural that just completed at Salina Elementary. And it's a beautiful depiction of a, a, a portion of the Arab American community proudly on a staple within the city of Dearborn. We are trying to work on building murals across Warren Avenue Corridor, Michigan East Corridor, Michigan West Corridor. This is a promising opportunity for Arab American artists to come to display their art publicly, to receive reward for it, obviously paying for that art, but for us to display it proudly. I think that's what's most important. So a person just driving by whose attention is caught by such a beautiful piece outside um, can walk away with something potentially if you're not from the city of Dearborn, with an understanding of what is Dearborn about, whether it's the beauty of Arabic calligraphy or any other type of mosaic or, or art piece. I think that's how you do it. East Michigan Avenue is trying to be an art conclave. We have the art space lofts, there's some additional pieces, um, but we have to do a better job in elevating that art publicly. Most folk don't know what happens inside of our space. People don't know what happens inside of this museum, which is why you have to meet people with, with where they are. Um, there's no reason why we can't begin to incorporate uh, Arab American artists and vendors within the various festivals that are happening across the city. Um, I think that's how you begin to break that down. Would that, would that something that you would aspire for, for Dearborn to be called as such? Absolutely, yes. absolutely. I think when you look to cities like Anaheim, California, which has the title Little Arabia, I don't know how. I don't know how Anaheim, California has, has passed a resolution signifying Little Arabia exists in Anaheim when we are the capital of Arab America. But there's never been the, you know, the will to actually cement it, whether it's via resolution or via signage or via art. And I think we're, we are, we're willing and more than we're, we're working on towards doing that.
Uh, many Dearborn residents, especially newer immigrants, have not fully grasped the aspects of American civil life. The separation between church and state, the freedom of expression, freedom of religion, etc. And many Arab Americans and Muslim Americans have found ways to marry between their faith and the American values at their personal, at a subjective level. But you have a more challenging situation because of your leadership position. It takes tremendous leadership to maneuver as a civil leader these cultural pressures while maintaining our constitutional values. And in my opinion, you have been doing a tremendous job. And I cannot imagine anyone doing it better. I've heard a lot of your interviews and the way you answer them is uh, right, you know, perfect way. For example, why, while you are Muslim by faith, you are pro-choice, you defend the constitutional and human and civil rights granted to the LGBTQ community, and you defend the freedom of speech, you defended our public libraries, and you have always been a strong advocate of public schools, and you preach tolerance, while you also accommodate as much as possible the religious institutions in the community and their continued demands, for public events, etc., and you have brought Eid al-Fitr to the city, for example, your uh, Ramadan to the state capital when you were back a representative. What is your philosophy of tolerance that you uh, integrate both your faith and your civil duty? In? That's a, that's a very challenging question. Um, first, I would disagree with you that I've done it perfectly. Uh, I have many a conversations with many mentors um, talking about the struggle, uh, where the improvements lie in every statement I've ever made. You know, how can I improve? What can I do better? I always think there's always room for improvement. Um, second, uh, you know, I, would, I grew up, uh, you know my family, you know Ami, and I lean on him for, for much. I grew up that my faith compels me to work on perfecting my own morals and values and not to cast judgment and try to perfect somebody else's. That is what I am responsible for. So that's how I practice my faith. My faith is not to, uh, Wissam does one, two, and three, oh, he's going to, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not made me the judge of anything. Um, let me work on myself. Um, when I'm in office, the hat I wear, certainly, I, I don't shy away from who I am. I'm Abdullah Hussain Hamoud, it doesn't go away. But I'm sworn to uphold the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the State of Michigan, and the, city of, the Code and Ordinances of the City of Dearborn. And that is a tough path to navigate wearing the hats that I wear. And so what I do is try to say, great, what is the best decision for the city of Dearborn, for all of its residents, in a secular American society? My job is to not enforce some perspective that might be overseas or to bring some sort of religious law. That's not what I'm, I'm sworn to uphold the Constitution of the U.S., Michigan, and the city of Dearborn. And that's what I do. This comes back to my opening statement of sometimes people have a tough time navigating the criticisms of me as mayor and criticisms of me as Muslim. Um, and I think we also have come to a point in our city where disagreement means disrespect. And I'm not, I'm not sure why. We should be able to disagree without casting disrespect. Um, and we in the Arab community don't do that well. Uh, we disagree and then when we have the Sahra on Sunday nights on your front porch eating batikh and drinking shai, we're shit talking you because we disagreed. Uh, that's what we do. Um, then also what I say is unfortunately Arab or Muslims more, you know, predominantly, have created their hierarchy of sin. It's okay to do X, Y, Z, A, B, C, D, E, F, but you cannot do the following. Um, and internally, they've, they've comprehended it that way, and I think that is a Muslim struggle more than a, a life struggle. Um, and so my job, again, do the best for all the people. It's not to be the Muslim mayor. It's to be the mayor who happens to be Muslim. Uh, and you have to understand that. Thank you. Final question before we open it to the audience. So uh, the future of Arabic as a second language in Dearborn. There is, uh, uh, Dearborn is, is always at a, uh, um, a testing stage of its, uh, the, the preservation of its Arabic language. It has been a struggle. I'm sure you've lived it yourself. Uh, and every, uh, every child in the city who's, uh, who's, who grew up in an Arab American family has lived that struggle of his family and himself or herself trying to preserve their language. The city uh, 
Does it have, does the city have um, the Arabic language, flourishing the Arabic language as a second language in the city because it carries so much culture within it, because it can be also good for business, etc. cetera? Uh, is it on the city's agenda? I, we've never thought about designating it by resolution. What I can tell you what we're putting in practice, last year we passed the, um, the ruling to make uh, Arabic translated ballots, the first city in the country to do so for all elections moving forward. That was one thing we brought forward. Secondly, we're working with Google now on a new partnership so we can translate all documents in our website in authentic Arabic um, that we're constructing and every single document that exits the city also in Arabic. And we even have our chat bot right now. It's in pilot mode. We actually nicknamed it Wasta. And so if you go to the website, Wasta opens up and is prepared to help you. Um, and you can talk to the chat bot in Arabic, English, or Spanish. Um, and it will respond to questions that we have actually programmed and it's taking note of other questions we haven't responded to yet. So we're beginning to incorporate it so it becomes normalized in city practice. Um, via resolution or such, you know, that's something we can always have a conversation about working with council. Um, but for me, it's less, resolutions are typically symbolic and don't mean anything in practice. What we're trying to do is ingratiate this within the city of Dearborn so it's actual policy and practice regardless of who's sitting as mayor. It shouldn't take a lot of mayor to make sure we have Arabic translations. You should cement it in every process across the whole city. So once I'm gone, regardless of who's in that seat, it's there and it'll be very difficult to remove. That's it, the more, the more promising. I'm gonna squeeze one more question and then we're gonna take questions. That question is with the changing demography of Dearborn. Uh, as, we, as we know from the prices of houses and the rent, there is a very high demand. It's a sort uh, over city. Is there plans to uh, deal with that, uh, such as having a higher uh, rise buildings, kind of uh, building a Williamsburg for Manhattan, uh, if, if, if uh, D downtown Detroit is the Manhattan? We are working with many developers who've come across land about building such developments. The question most of developers have, and uh, the good news is most of these developers are Dearborn residents, and, and many of them are Muslim Arab American. The question they have though, they always say, Does, would Jama'atna live in such a thing? Because we have no case example you can point to. There is no 15 story building in the city of Dearborn that's filled with young people. Uh, we, don't, we don't have that. And so they're trying to assess the market and understanding our community. Have we, pro you know, have we come to a point where, yeah, you know what? A 20 story building will actually fill with a lot of Arab families who have larger families. Because we all want basements and square footage and backyards garages. and garages, which is this whole separate conversation, okay? Uh, and so the question is though, would you take a 600 square foot one bedroom apartment? It hasn't been tested in the market yet. And so that's why they're all, we're conducting a market study now as a city to try to help the developers with making that decision. And so we're working through it. Some of them are looking at like four to six floors, but the question if you want true density, you're talking nine floors plus. And the well, other thing you have to combat is nimbyism. You know, people always say, yes, I want a high rise, but I don't want it in my neighborhood. I want a high rise, but make sure it's all market rate high end because I don't want X and X to move in. And so we also have to understand, you know, we all came as immigrants. How in God's name did it become that we now want to frown on those that have come with little to nothing? Because alhamdulillah, we've made it, we've moved to the West End, and we're saying, oh, but look at these people coming now. That was you 20 years ago. That was your father, that was your grandfather, that was your mother, your grandmother. And it, so that, we also have to combat that to some capacity. And so I don't like to use the phrase affordable housing. I like to use the phrase workforce housing. And if you just graduated recently, you're looking for a job, you're not making six figures, you have to be able to afford your rent and your rent shouldn't be 50% of your salary. And so we're having these conversations about how we also frame the words that we use within the community that we're operating in. Thank you. The floor is open now. Uh, Mr. Al-Qamous, if you can help. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Is there anyone uh, who has a question? I'll start here right up front. Thank you. Welcome, Mayor. Um, I, as uh, one of your new constituents, since I moved uh, to Dearborn two years ago from Ann Arbor, and I miss it only this much. <laughs> Dearborn has a lot to offer. I live in, in the South Waverly area. I love my neighborhood. And also welcome as a fellow member of the uh, uh, Culture and the Arts. 
Um, I'm going to ask you a tough question, like why did, did it take the city a year to remove two tree stumps, or why I got the crab apple tree instead of you know uh, cherry blossom, which I ordered. I'll ask you an easier question. So, <laughs> um, I'm reviewing a book, Mayor, about the Muslims of the heartland. This fellow wrote a pretty impressive account of. He traced families from Iowa and Minnesota and Dakota all the way to Michigan and family networks, pretty valuable. By the time he got to Michigan, he got it all wrong and he listed, for example, Ali uh, Hassan as the founder of Axis, for example, uh, which is an uncritical um, account. Correcting the record on that front will render someone as persona non grata. This is the background. I'm not gonna ask you about that, of course. But I am really inspired to ask you this question, given your introductory remarks, and also your remarks to our students on their graduation. I was in faculty regalia during that graduation, and you talked about work ethic at the time. I remember that very well. And our students actually need inspiration, need mentorship, and I'm not certain that they're finding that all the time. They're treated as pawns very often, uh, so my question to you is that we, in your place, for example, you probably navigated the grassroots and the grass tops. You know, the deep pockets, institutions, the endorsements, but your remarks uh, is a clear indication that you are connected to the grassroots. And our students are grassroots. And they are run being, you know, pawned by the grass tops. I'll, I'll leave that aside. We don't care about who or why. I'm even trying to avoid that subject for my new book as much as I can, but it's not going that direction so far. So what do you think about these things? How do you navigate the grassroots versus the grass tops? Thank you for that easy question. Um, when I first inquired about running for state rep and I was having conversations with the grass tops what was important from my perspective, and I was 25, you know, but I still consider that young. Um, I never sought permission. I sought support. Very distinguishable. And so that, that provides a level of empowerment if you give the grass tops the ability to tell you yes or no. And this is while I was getting feedback like, well, who asked you to run? Who told you to run? Um, and my, my response was, well, nobody. I'm, if you'd like to support Ahlan la Sahlan, if not, Thank you very much, and you know, I'll focus on my grassroots, which I'm always focused on. To the youth, what I tell you is, you, know, you don't need permission to accomplish what you need to accomplish, what you set out for yourself. Uh, you need to just have the work ethic and, and the will to go out and do it. Um, you know, I, I came from a very working poor household, if, if you don't know. Lived in 12 homes by the age of 14, was homeless for a period of time, um, worked every job you can imagine from valet to frying chicken at a gas station on eight mile in Grashit for Hash Hassan Mackie, which is probably the funnest job I ever had. Um, but it also grounds you to never forget where you came from. And I think that's what I hold on to. You know, as mayor, what I didn't start doing was stop hanging out with the people who I've always associated with. I didn't just go try to congregate with the grass tops at the country clubs and so on and so forth. You find me with Methat at Ahamas and Haji Maryam and Bilal and Sayyid Ali eating a shawarma normally, uh, engaging in conversation, not changing who I am. That's, I think, what's most important. The most valuable thing you can find an elected official, I'm obviously slightly biased, um, is authenticity. It's hard to find authenticity. You know, I always get asked, like, why did I endorse Bernie Sanders? Uh, I don't agree 100% with Bernie's policies. But nobody can tell me that Bernie Sanders has changed in 60 years. He's been the same. If you ever watch the videos of Bernie, and he looks the same in 1912, okay? He's been saying the same things for 100 years. That is hard to do in this line of work. You don't find it often. Um, <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you what Sayyid Kazwini said when he introduced Bernie Sanders at Salina Elementary. He said, politicians are like sperm. Out of every billion, one is a human being. <laughs> he said this on national stage. There's some truth to that. And forgive for the example, but it's a funny example. 
Um, that, that's what you have to do. You have to remain humble with the community, with those that help bring you up. The reality is I'm not sitting where I am because the grass tops helped. I'm where I am because of my parents who struggled and my family who supported and the community who knocked and voted. I wouldn't be here without you. The microphone is not mine. The great John Dingle once said, uh, you don't have power as an elected official. Um, you, know, they, they, you are lended the power for a period of time by the people. The power is with the people. And you can never forget it. And to the youth, don't aspire to be me. Aspire to be 10, 100 levels above me. Being me would be a failure. Because you know, we've shattered the ceiling. Great. Go to shatter the next ceiling. That's what you have to do. If we continually just aim to do what we've always done, like I feel like you know, there's, you know, we're 100,000 people and 90,000 want to be judges in the city of Dearborn. At some point, we have to look beyond judges. Okay? We have to Great, how do I get to Supreme Court? How do I get to federal judgeship? That is where we need to start attaining and more than just the local district judges. And I love my local district judges, but look for beyond. Uh, anyone else, uh, another question? Thank you, Mayor. Real quick, what are three things that don't exist in the city or policies that don't exist that you want to see implemented or <clears throat> brought to the city that don't exist now? The first thing I'll tell you is cleanliness, okay? Most of you have heard, I imagine, the garbage story. Picked up some garbage. Uh, that, that was our community. You know, I, I came home and uh, I actually almost cried uh, talking to my wife, and she said, what's wrong? I said, it's the to tell somebody the age of my father about cleanliness because we're supposed to be the community of cleanliness, and so for me, cleanliness is like the number one policy. If you, somebody were to come to your house, Yusuf, somebody's coming to your, to your mother's house, uh, you had to make sure that the room that nobody sits in was spotless. It's a must. So why don't we treat the rest of the city that way? Why is it okay to throw your garbage on the floor? Why is it okay to dump it in the park? Why is it okay to open up your car door and dump everything outside? Why is there a lack of ihtiram? That's like the number one, two, and three policy I would enact. Because if you have a beautiful city, all those who come visit are gonna wanna come again. If you ever went to your friend's house growing up and you smelled like a mluchi or tabikh when you walked out, the first thing you said is like, I'm not gonna go back if their mom is cooking. It's the same thing. If you come to a city that has a funky smell and that turns you off with the way it looks, you're gonna tell yourself, I don't wanna come back. It's the same exact thing. Nothing has changed. Um, secondly, uh, selfishly, I would love to see a bowling alley and activities for youth again. We're building peace parks you know, these three new destination parks to give young people something to do. When I talk with young people on the campaign, something they express, I was like, what do you guys do when you're hanging around? These are like 17 to 21 year olds. They vape, they hang out at the abandoned village plaza. They're typically on the rooftop of a parking duck doing something stupid. They're drifting at Ford Field. They're terrorizing a golf course with a screwdriver. And I asked why? They said, well, where are we supposed to go? Where do you want us to hang out? The masjid, where do we go? I feel that, where, where do you go as a young person in the city of Dearborn, aside from the matam? You can eat all you wanna eat. After you leave the matam, then what? We don't have much offerings for, for this age group. And even now as a new father, my daughter's 20 months. Where do I take her in the city? Great, I can take her to the swing set. On a rainy day, what do you do? On a snowy day, where do you go? You can only go to the same museum so many times. And so we're trying to build a STEM center uh, that you can come to. We're trying to see how you can learn aquariums and, 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 and things of that nature. So we have to diversify in the amenities that we offer young people of all ages. I think those are the two main things I'd focus on. I have time for one more. And I apologize if I didn't get to you. I'm really sorry. We'll try, um, we'll try this one. Okay, I, this is a bit of a selfish question, so I apologize, but it's a little personal also, but uh, I just graduated high school and I'm going to college to study political science as a political science major. And one thing I always get told as an Arab, as a Muslim, is like I always feel like there's a stigma around being a politician that's covered with lies and what you're doing is basically haram and you shouldn't do it, okay? I think we, it, from everything I know about you, we had pretty similar backgrounds. I think you were raised with those same values, I'm assuming. So my question is, Inshallah, I want to be at the point that you're at, at the, you know, at least. But for you personally, when you're in bed, when you're at the masjid, when you're just reflecting on everything you've done, does that stigma or does that feeling of like, like does it ever make you feel like an outcast or does it ever feel like you're doing something wrong by being in politics? Ooh, 
Um, the short answer is yes, because I too have a distaste for politicians. Um, but I know the inside workings, and so I should have a distaste because I see the actions that happen. Uh, but that's why you try to do it authentically yourself. Because you say, I think I'm of, I can offer uh, of benefit, that I have an agenda, and I think if I accomplish this, it'll be beneficial to most. If that's your intention, regardless of what others will say, they're always going to say it. If you try to, uh, try to get everybody to uh, be supportive and so on and so forth, you've already failed. You know, I, I, when I approached my parents and I sat them down and I said, I'm running for office, my father looked at me and said, and said no ismak Abdullah. Did you forget that your name is Abdullah? That was his response to me. And he told me no. And my mother said, and said, lish tarakna libnin. That was her response to me, and she told me no. And I asked this 40 days after my brother Marhum Ali passed away. This is when this all fell together, not knowing to me. It's you know how I ran for office. Um, in the most difficult of times, and they both looked at me and said, I be shown for you to do this right now. The first year, you should do nothing. We all know this. The practice, the ayb, you should be doing nothing. So if you look at my campaign, my family was largely absent because I told them I will never involve you as I run for this office. And so sometimes it's not about what others think. You're going to have to go against the grain. You might even go against the will of those closest to you. But if you have your heart set on it for the right reasons, your niyyat dahra, and you think you can accomplish something that is worthwhile, and you think you can do it to a greater degree, my answer to you is then what are you waiting for? If you're waiting for somebody to tell you go and do it, it's not gonna come. It has to come from you. You know, my biggest opponent on a campaign trail is never the person I'm running against. Because I'm never running against anybody. I'm running for something. If you're running against somebody you've already lost, I always got that question. Who are you running against? I'm not running against anybody. There are other candidates in the race, but let me tell you what I'm running for. I'm running for X, Y, Z, one, two, three. Um, and so you have to have that mindset. Uh, and if you have it, and you have the right people surrounding you, you'll be successful in whatever you, in, whatever you accomplish. Thank you so much. Some noise for Mayor Hamoud, please. <laughs> Mayor Hamoud, I guess we have time. Uh, if, if we're gonna take this last question, I'll leave that to you and then um, I guess we'll be able to wrap up from there. This is like the Thank you for waiting. goodbye. We just, you know, we'll keep doing this for the next 35 minutes. First of all, welcome all of you to the museum. I'm glad and proud to be one of the founders of this museum, one of the founders of Yaba, which I am the executive director of Yaba Yemen American Benevolent Associations. <laughs> also co-founder of Access. This is the product of Access. I'm glad that the museum doing a tremendous job, hosting some events like this, and they have so many programs. Abdullah, I've been know him for so many years. I support him when he was state rep, and I think he did a good job. As a mayor, I give you a plus. That doesn't mean everyone is satisfied, when they move the city administration to the new one, a lot of people weren't satisfied. But right now, they are glad that they moved over there. You cannot satisfy everybody. Keep doing what you're doing. My question is, what do you think is the main things that you have done that you accomplish and you are satisfied with that? The second one, what is you think you can accomplish for the future that the best for our community? And if there is any challenge, what will be the challenge? My last advice for your administration, your office, make sure when somebody contact you or contact any workers that you respond right away. Thank you. Thank you. So three, part, three questions. Um, the greatest success, this is hard to measure. I think it's, um, I'll tell you one of the things I'm most proud of. Um, and first and foremost, I, I get the microphone, I ran for office, so I typically get the credit, but the success is on the team that did the work. One of the things I was proud of, and it started when I was a state rep and bled into becoming mayor in my first year. Um, 
I, I was having a conversation one day with David Knizek, who was a brother to me. And I said, Dave, when you left the legislature, you know, how do you ensure that you left you know, some level of a legacy that this thing is ongoing and still giving back? How, what, what can you do? He taught me about what an endowment was. He said, you know, you can endow something. Then I thought about what's actually important in the state of Michigan and important in the city of Dearborn. Our reading rates are subpar. The reading rates across the state of Michigan are subpar. I think third graders have like a 33% literacy rate in the state of Michigan. It's very bad. And so I worked for three years to get $3 million to go into an endowment. So every child between the age of zero and five gets a free book mailed to their house every single month. And so by the time you enter kindergarten at five, you've already had at minimum 60 books. And why is that important in our community? Not only is that child able to have access to a book at a time when libraries are diminishing, but the parent of a bilingual household whose English might not be perfect also has the opportunity to strengthen their English. And if you look at literacy rates, better literacy rates leads to better life outcomes. That to me, when I'm long gone, this endowment will be here forever and nobody can ever touch those dollars and it's set in stone for this project. That to me was one of the biggest things. When it comes you know, to your second of like long term, what I actually want to accomplish, it's not a specific policy. It's more of a Dearborn 2040. You know, my daughter's you know, uh, 20 months. Um, and for me, it's what is the life of Maryam Hamoud 20 years from now? And the vision I have is that it was far better than all of ours. And that's going to take more than one policy to get right. You have to get a whole host of things right. But if we do it, and her life and everybody, her generation's life is that much better, I think we all walk away winners. And we all walk away with our heads on pillows saying we've done everything we can, even if we did not reap the reward, but the next generation did. I think that, to me, is the ultimate vision and success. And lastly, I'm as responsive as one can be as mayor. You know, I even have people calling my mom and my dad sometimes, frustrated with me or trying to get a hold of me. Um, I've had people go to my Amu Sheikh at the Jama and the Masjid and pull him to the office to talk about me. And so I've been stopped at a funeral, I've been stopped at a wedding, I've been stopped at a restaurant. And so I'm as accommodating as one can possibly be. Forgive me if I did not respond to your Snapchat message or your Facebook message or your Instagram DM or, you know, to your uh, uh, into this WhatsApp group chat. Uh, I do my best to accommodate all. And so forgive me if I've ever fallen short. Thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, Mayor Abdullah Hamoud, spoken word. <laughs> spoken word. I feel like I've just said everything I wanted to say in my long-winded answers to all those questions. Um, you know, I, I, um, I was not always confident in being Abdullah San Hamoud. I'll tell you that. Uh, I grew up... Uh, largely bullied. I was a very small kid in high school um, and in middle school and elementary school. And growing up in the post 9-11 era, whenever we went out as, as Arab uh, and as Arab men, we all had nicknames. Uh, I was Abe, Yahya was John, Hamad was Kurt, Mustafa was Steve, Ali was Alex, and, and the whole nine. It's because we didn't want to say our names out loud whenever we left the city. And I recall when I was 16, we're in the city of Livonia, and we're using our, our nicknames. We got surrounded by about 25 white men in their 20s. I was 16. And they flung their cigarettes at us, and they said, uh, we don't want your Middle Eastern oil, we want British petroleum. And we had to walk away because we're surrounded by 20 to 30 men. I remember when I got accepted to University of Michigan Ann Arbor, Ann Arbor was supposed to be this progressive mecca and the brightest and the best are in this institution. I'm in my first semester of my Master of Public Health and I sit down at the table and it's in the winter, there's a snowstorm. I take off my hat. On the inside of my hat, there was actually a quote from the Bible. And I read it to the group that I was sitting with. Me. I was like, man, this is really cool. And the gentleman across from me said, took the hat, read the quote, and he said, did you know that your prophet slaughtered millions of people to start his religion? And the girl sitting next to him, also in my class, said, yeah, I learned the same thing. And I had nothing to counter their point. And I used to go then by Abe and Abdullah and accommodate to anybody that couldn't get my name right. It was that day 
when I was 19, I said, I will no longer ever accommodate for anybody. But be, in order for me to do that, I have to educate myself on who I am, what my lineage is, and more about my faith and my identity. And I think that's what I've tried to do since that day when I was 19. As mayor, you're challenged on a daily basis to get things 100% right. And I think the difficulty that people fail to see is humans are flawed. And so by default, Abdullah Hamoud is flawed. And you know, the job I relate to most, interestingly, is to that of my uncle, the sheikh. And we sit and we talk for hours and our similarities are people expect you to be perfect in everything you do and say. And when they talk about you, you can't respond. And you also know the things that the traditional folk might not know. Meaning the person who's talking about you might have a whole host of secrets that, you're, that you are aware of for why the actions are such, but you can't talk about it. And what I tell folk is, Mat kabruna, we're just people. I don't want you to hold me on this high pedestal of be Abdullah, so on and so forth. Uh, I'm, I'm just a human being. And no doubt, I'm going to fail multiple times. I'm going to get things wrong multiple times. And the only quality that I enjoy in myself is that I try to always do better and I try to keep myself grounded. And alhamdulillah, I have the wife that is able to keep me grounded uh, and give me the honest to God truth in anything of my actions. And that's what I would tell all of you. That's the message I have. Uh, don't aim for perfect because uh, it doesn't exist. And don't hold people up so high that you're going to be disappointed because I promise you I will disappoint you at some point in time, whether you know it or not. And I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. But I think uh, that that's, that's honestly uh, my, my thought process. That's why I've given you any spoken word. You know, it's not in poetic fashion, so forgive me. There's no rhyming scheme to my, uh, my spoken word. But um, those are my thoughts. You know, I have to uh, accept that um, and, and just do my best. And with that, I thank you all so much for having me. Um, I thank you all for coming out and wish you all a great night. Thank you so much, Mayor Hamoud. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. We're here every third Wednesday of the month. Thank you so much, Mayor. Perfect. Thank you guys so much. Listen, next time you come out, you know we can sign up. If you have some spoken word, you perform some music, you do anything like that, um, you can sign up or just come on out. We open the stage, and we're here again every third Wednesday of the month. On your way out, check out the ASAP table. All right, thank you, of course. Good night, everybody. See you.